today's topic, which is on uh, the teaching of calculus. So a very good afternoon again to all of you. Uh, um, this is my name here, and I'm going to uh, speak today on um, <coughs> the teaching of calculus, and this is my lecture outline. Um, we'll first look at a simple concept map for the, for the topic of calculus, and then I'll talk a little bit about the syllabus that is related to what uh, most of you will be um, hopefully doing, and that's in additional mathematics. I understand that in this class, in this lecture group, there are some of you who will be going on to uh, a junior college, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll leave the, junior, uh, the JC portion to your respective tutor. So I'm addressing the teaching of calculus at the secondary level in this lecture. Uh, we'll also move on to talk a little bit about, um, in fact, talk a lot about uh, differential calculus, and then a little bit about um, integral calculus, and then uh, marry the two by fundamental theorem of calculus, and I wouldn't say very much about applications of calculus, um, and then I will summarize the lecture. Now, before we go on to talk about um, the actual teaching of calculus itself, maybe it's useful for us to refer to some of the publications on the teaching of calculus. In fact, a lot has been written about uh, on the teaching of calculus, and I'm just giving you a very small um, sample of some of the readings that you may be interested in. So again, before we jump into the teaching of calculus, uh, maybe we would like to ask ourselves this question. Um, uh, what kinds of mathematics or what skills should uh, students have before they are ready uh, to learn calculus? So maybe that's important because we need to at least make sure that the students have a certain set of skills or master a certain uh, set of topics before they come into a calculus class. So I'll give you maybe about... Uh, uh, not too much time, 30 seconds, <laughs> to maybe talk to your neighbour and come up with one or two ideas. Yes, just... Algebra. Algebra, okay, good. What else? Indices. Indices, okay, that is like part of algebra, yeah? Okay. Limits, Limits. okay. Uh, would you agree that coordinate geometry might be important? For a second, I'm talking in terms of a, uh, from the perspective of a secondary school student. Uh, would you agree that functions and graph, important to have all these uh, basic concepts um, mastered before they enter a, um, <coughs> a calculus classroom? How about trigonometry? Yeah. Um, algebra, yes, you might mention, and also uh, you mentioned indices and so on. So I lump it together as algebra and say uh, not just algebra, but in fact uh, manipulation of algebraic expressions. Yeah. Um, the idea of a tangent, and, and one of you mentioned the idea of a limit. Um, in fact, the idea of a limit uh, in, 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 in secondary, at secondary level may not be that uh, important or crucial yet. Um, uh, but perhaps at a higher level in the, in the JC or maybe beyond that, uh, perhaps it's important to have this idea of a limit because you have a direct application of this idea in the study of calculus. Now, the next question I will ask is that, okay, we know now what a student should need. Maybe these are the basic set of uh, knowledge and skills that the student ought to have before they, we say that they are ready to study calculus or to learn calculus. But what about the teacher? What do you think the teacher should know before uh, the teacher is ready to teach calculus? Anyone? The six points that are still learning, okay. In addition to that, okay. In addition to what the students ought to have known, what about uh, the teacher? Yes. What else do you think the teacher, yeah? Okay, my first point is plenty of calculus. Would you agree? Yeah? I mean, if you want to teach calculus, you should know calculus itself, right? Or, in fact, more than just what you ought to uh, uh, know to teach, yeah? Uh, <clears throat> Perhaps you also should know the formal definitions of things like derivative, integral, and so on, even though you may not really need it or or use it in the classroom as a teacher, I think it's important that you know the uh, formal definitions. Um, perhaps also the uh, idea of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, 
Then uh, perhaps applications of calculus is good as a teacher to, uh, to be aware of how calculus can be used and applied in uh, various uh, dis other disciplines as well as in the real world. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I also think that uh, uh, some history of calculus will be useful. Um, very often, um, mathematics teachers are sort of, uh, I wouldn't say accused or criticized, but uh, 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 singled out for uh, not telling enough stories in the classroom. Right? Uh, we, we are sort of... Um, uh, portray as just going into a classroom, listing out uh, uh, formula, giving examples, and that's the end of the lesson. Uh, maybe it's good to know some uh, history in terms of calculus, and also uh, perhaps to uh, have an idea of the colorful characters uh, involved in the discovery and development of calculus, so that you can tell some stories. And I will be telling you a story later yeah, in this lecture. Maybe some numerical methods for solving uh, problems in calculus. Although, again, this is not needed in the um, uh, secondary level, nor in, well, in the um, junior college level, yes, if you are doing H3, uh, there's some numerical methods for differential equations, but in terms of uh, um, secondary um, mathematics and additional mathematics uh, for calculus topic, you actually do not need numerical methods. But I think, uh, as a teacher, it's good for you to know uh, a, a different set of methods of, of solution. Um, it's probably also good to know some IT tools, uh, because you may use these tools for your teaching, for your demonstration, and so on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's also perhaps good to um, have a good sense of uh, um, knowledge in uh, pedagogy or pedagogical content knowledge uh, related to uh, calculus uh, so that you are able to provide uh, the kind of experiences that's necessary uh, for the learner to not just know but also understand um, the concepts in calculus and uh, perhaps many more things yeah and so on <laughs> so that covers everything yeah uh, so e essentially you find that in order for you to be a competent and a good um, uh, calculus teacher, there's a lot uh, you can do uh, in terms of preparing yourself uh, <coughs> for the teaching of calculus. <coughs> so now we know how the student should prepare himself or herself, and we know how the teacher also, like you, you know, should prepare yourself. Uh, let us look at the uh, topic itself in terms of a concept map. Yeah? Uh, if I were to ask you to draw a concept map, um, linking all those concepts and topics and so on that will lead to calculus. You can draw a different set of um, uh, uh, different pictures or different concept map as, as this one here, but this is one way of relating the different topics together. Uh, you probably uh, would agree with me that you know functions in terms of uh, the different kinds of functions, trigo functions and graphs of functions and so on is, is an important uh, prerequisite. We have already said that before, yeah. So this will hopefully lead on to the ideas of limits if that is necessary yeah, for us to move on to um, calculus. And under limits, you, you have uh, ideas like Riemann sum and uh, tangent to a curve, uh, rate of change, and so on. Yeah. And eventually, these ideas will lead on to uh, differential calculus and integral calculus, and also the um, fundamental theorem of calculus. And from there, uh, then uh, we can talk about the applications um, of uh, di differential calculus as well as the applications of integral calculus. And this whole thing forms uh, at least uh, what we know to be uh, what is important within the topic of calculus. So these are the uh, um, topics or subtopics that will link together, um, that, that form something like a con concept map. Now, um, th this is not, of course, the answer or the model answer, but it is one way of representing the connections. Yeah. Um, so let us now look at the syllabus. This is the uh, latest uh, new syllabus or uh, uh, extract from the uh, syllabus of the additional mathematics uh, 4038. There's an older one which will be phased out, um, I think, this year. So it will be very irrelevant to you because even if you go to your practicum uh, next year, uh, and you, if, you, if you have to teach additional mathematics, uh, this will be the syllabus I believe that you'll be teaching. Uh, there are some uh, changes. 
and um, I will not uh, go through uh, um, everything, but I just want to show you these are the topics that are in the uh, additional math syllabus. It is good for you as a teacher to be aware, at least look through it, okay? at least have an idea of what the uh, topics are involved. Yeah. Uh, and um, there, are, there are too many uh, topics here to, 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 to sort of to go through in a short lecture like this. So I will uh, suggest that you run through these topics in your own time, pick up a uh, additional maths uh, textbook, and then maybe uh, uh, look through it and see whether, uh, in terms of the, the topic itself, calculus, whether the textbook has sufficient coverage for these topics and so on. I mean, that's a good exercise for you to familiarize yourself uh, one more time. I know you have done this before, maybe many years ago, uh, perhaps um, it's a good idea to refresh and to familiarize yourself with the latest uh, um, syllabus. Um, it's also good to know what is not included in the new syllabus, um, particularly these three points. Um, implicit differentiation, for example, has been taken out. Um, finding area of region between curve and oblique line and uh, between two curves. This used to be uh, in the syllabus and now it's taken out and, and so on. So, so uh, my point is that it is important to um, be aware of um, what are the topics within uh, calculus that um, a secondary school um, student ought to learn. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the next uh, <clears throat> section on uh, differential calculus. I think the most basic and fundamental um, idea or concept in differential calculus is the idea of the derivative of a function. In fact, the word derivative here of a function it, it just, just means a derived function. It's a function itself that is derived from another function. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Those of you who are interested in investments and, 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 and uh, investing in stocks and options and so on uh, would have heard of financial derivatives. So a financial derivative is not really something, but it's something which you derive from the basic stocks and so on. So in the same way, um, the derivative of a function is something that you derive from another function. So what are the ways of um, um, introducing this concept and so on? Um, again, I refer back to uh, what David Tall uh, mentioned in one of his papers. Now, he said that um, the job and the duty of a math mathematics educator or a teacher is to provide a range of different experiences, okay, to develop the ideas of, let's say, calculus in a cognitive manner so that the learner can uh, know, both know as well as understand. So I think in this case, if you want to talk about introducing a concept, it is good to be able to have a range of different ideas or different ways of introducing the same concept. Okay? So that uh, if a student has difficulty understanding that concept from this angle, there's an alternative way for him to understand. So I think that is an important uh, point. I think that's a, a good, a good uh, uh, so-called philosophy to uh, adhere to. So um, here I give you three ways that you may um, think about or choose or even develop yourself uh, <clears throat> uh, that um, possible ways of introducing the same concept, the idea of a derivative. One is by definition. Uh, <clears throat> the other one is by description. And the last one by drawing. You see, I have intentionally chosen three words all starting with D. So it's easier to remember. So by definition, this is the definition. Right. So I will, I will, I will um, <coughs> go through some examples, um, perhaps a few examples, just to show you uh, how to use a definition, for example, to um, find the derivative of a function. Okay, this is my first, this is my first example. And um, suppose I want to find the uh, first derivative of f with respect to x, uh, by definition, that's the limit as h tends to 0 of, let's say, f of x plus h take f of x divided by h, right? <coughs> okay, so um, 
I'm going to just work through the whole thing. Now, I'm going to use this as my f of x, and whenever I see x, I replace it with x plus h. So I have something like x plus h squared plus twice of x plus h, take 1. Take away x squared plus 2x, take 1. And the whole expression is divided by h. Um, now, you can go through the algebra and so on. That's why algebra manip algebraic manipulation is one of the uh, uh, skills that we think that students ought to have. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but we know that the x is going to cancel with the Sorry, the x squared is going to um, uh, cancel with that one, and then you have a 2xh. And you have a h squared. And then plus 2x minus 2x, that goes plus 2h, and then you have a negative 1 here and a positive 1 there, and that goes to 0. And so this is the expression that we have. And uh, of course, we can then um, divide numerator and denominator uh, by h. And uh, as h tends to 0, you are left with 2x plus 2. <coughs> So that's how we, we can uh, use the definition to find the first derivative of a function. This is uh, not, uh, not too hard. The next one is slightly harder, only slightly. Uh, um, in school, particularly in secondary school, we'll tell students that the first derivative of sine x is cos x. When I mean, your students ask why, you will say, don't ask. Just take it that it's a rule. <laughs> I think um, it, uh, it's okay if, to say that if you really know why, but you, the, 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 the reason why you are telling the student not to ask is not because you do not know, but because they are not ready. I mean, that's fine. But if you say, don't ask because you do not know, I think uh, maybe that's not so nice. So, if you, if you have not come across the actual derivation um, <clears throat> for the first derivative, I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> you might want to discuss it with your uh, tutors because we do not have time to do so many things, but it's a good idea to go and find out. Yeah? So, this one, you either do it yourself or you discuss it somewhere else. I will discuss the next example here because this is a little bit... Um, more interesting. So suppose you are given a um, function f of x equals to a to the x. a is some base that's constant bigger than zero. And um, you want to find uh, the first derivative of f with respect to x. Again, if you use the uh, definition, that's the limit as h tends to uh, zero. I'm going to uh, put the um, <coughs> expression in straight away. So that will be a to the x plus h. That's my f of x plus h take away a to the x, that's f of x divided by h. And simplify a little bit by taking out the um, <coughs> common factor of a to the h, uh, sorry, a to the x. You have a to the h take 1 over h. <coughs> and in this case, of course, your a to the h is constant with respect to h, so we can take it out of the limit here, this way. Okay. So we've reached this stage and we ask ourselves, um, what is this limit? Like? Mm. So now we are in trouble because we either have to evaluate this limit in some way and uh, students at uh, secondary level may not be um, uh, quite ready to um, evaluate this limit. But if we don't do that, then we can't really have um, uh, an expression uh, for the first derivative of f respect to x in this case. Uh, we can do, it, do this several ways. We, let, let's, let's experiment and see what happens. Now, if I, um, it, it turns out that for different values of a, this limit will be different. Okay, I say that again. For different values of a, this limit will turn out to be a different number. 
So suppose we experiment with different values. Okay. So suppose I take A to be, to, be, to be 2, and it turns out that when A is 2 and let H goes towards 0, okay, I can try both left hand and right hand, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it turns out that um, um, the limit tends towards a certain number, 0.693 in this case. Yeah. And if I take um, A to be 2.5, the limit turns out to be another number, 0.9 something. Now. If I take A to be 3, it's mm, 1 point something now. And 3.5, 1.252, 2, and so on. Um, so if we, it's not very interesting if, I, if, if we stop here, right? But uh, perhaps it is uh, 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 good to ask a question. Yeah? It comes back to the special number which I asked you to uh, list out at the beginning of the lecture. And one of the numbers, the first number you say that's special is 1. I agree with you, 1 is very special. So suppose we want to find out at what value of A will I get a limit which is equals to 1. Uh, maybe that is interesting, yeah? we can sort of analyze it this way. We have something like a to the h take 1 over h. If h is small enough uh, and for a special value of a or some value of a, I want this to be very close to 1 or going towards 1 yeah, if h is small enough. And it turns out that I can uh, sort of write this down as a to the h equals to say 1 plus h. Yeah. And, um, and that means that I can write it down as A is, or uh, maybe I should say approximately, and A is approximately uh, 1 plus uh, H to the 1 over H. Uh, we can write it in another way. Instead of saying H, we can, we can let H be uh, 1 over N. Then uh, I will have an expression um, that is of the form 1 plus 1 over N to the end. And if I take the limit as n tends to infinity, this will actually give me the number e. Okay. So in other words, in other words, e as in um, 2.718 and so on. In other words, we have a special case here. If our f of x is equal to e to the x, then f prime x is equal to, this will be 1, so I will get e to the x. This is a special case. So you see that what I'm trying to say here is that there are different ways of uh, motivating or stating the same thing. Now, if we are talking about teaching at the, uh, perhaps the uh, <coughs> secondary level, there's the first time that the students are encountering derivatives, differentiation, and so on. And in order to um, give them an idea of what uh, is the derivative of e to the s, and by the way, that's included in the um, additional maths syllabus, um, you may want to just write this down as a rule because you may not want to go through the whole thing. Or alternatively, you may want to go through this thing, but then not asking them to evaluate this limit because they probably will not be at a stage where they are able to evaluate limits. Um, so it all depends on um, how well prepared your students are. Um, but on the other hand, when you, um, are, suppose you are teaching uh, the same thing at uh, uh, a, a JC level in H2 maths, for example, um, you, you may want to try to use uh, what I've just done, doing, going through the same thing and having your students experiment with different values of A and then finding that particular special value of A which will give you this uh, result. At an even higher level, let's say in the university, you may also do the same thing, but instead of experimenting, you may want to, because they have, your students may have already learned how to evaluate limits, you may want your students to evaluate this limit. So you see, at different levels, for the same thing, you can, have dif you can provide different experiences to the student. The, the, the point is that you need to know um, at what level you're pitching and uh, whether it's appropriate or not, and whether your students are ready or prepared for that kind of treatment. 
right? So that's my point. So, so much for the first um, way of introducing the derivative. Um, <clears throat> another way of introducing or talking about derivative is to describe it, describe a derivative, the gradient or tangent of graph of a function at a point. Um, or you can describe it as a rate of change. Uh, I've checked uh, some textbooks, um, and this is how the, um, some textbook writers uh, describe um, the idea or put forward the idea of derivative. They describe it as rate of change, they describe it as gradient of tangent of graph at a point. But this, again, in words, it may not be um, easy to see or, or understand. So perhaps a third way uh, is by actually drawing the graph. You talk about uh, um, uh, a gradient of a tangent of a graph at a point and so on. Perhaps uh, it's good to illustrate that with an example. So I'm going to use this same example which I used just now. Uh, suppose you have a function f x equals to x squared plus 2x minus 1. Um, this is how the graph looks like. Um, suppose I want to know at this point uh, what is the gradient of the tangent. Now, uh, what, what do I understand by it? Let, let, let me just uh, focus on this point first. Right? And suppose uh, I want to zoom in closer and closer to this point. Uh, obviously, I can't uh, really do it in any other way except to use uh, some kind of technology like this for example using Graphmatica and I trust everybody in this room uh, knows how to use uh, Graphmatica, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, this is the, the point that I'm talking about here. Okay, and suppose I want to uh, get very close to it, let's see what happens. Okay. what it looks like now. Let me zoom in some more. Okay. Um, perhaps I zoom in one more time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but my curve becomes a straight line. As far as this part is concerned. This part of the curve, as I get very close, and I zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and so on, uh, it looks like a straight line to me. Uh, in fact, uh, what kind of uh, uh, straight line um, does it look like? Let me see. Yeah? Um, let me just uh, draw this other line. I've just drawn a line on the same graph, y equals to 4x minus 2. Can you see the line? Can you see the curve of the line? You can't see this. It's, it's, it looks like I have not uh, done anything. Uh, maybe uh, they are a bit too close together. Let me zoom out now. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm zooming out. Am I zooming out? Oops. Oh, yeah, I'm zooming out. Oh, oh now you can see the line in the graph, right? This was the line I drew. The straight line, I mean, and this uh, was the, the original graph. <laughs> okay, so, so you can see that um, <clears throat> when we talk about the derivative, what I have drawn this line here, in fact, is the equation of the straight line that is actually the tangent line to the graph at this point. All right, that is y equals to 4x minus 2. And you find that if I zoom in very close to that point, uh, in fact, we're not talking about just the uh, derivative giving us the gradient of the tangent to the curve. It is the gradient of the curve at that point itself. And that, that, this was the point that uh, David told mentioned when he first used technology, it was the first few people to use technology to illustrate this idea of uh, gradient of tangent of a curve at a point using uh, a graphing tool. So we might want to use something like this, uh, some kind of technological tool um, to illustrate the idea of uh, <coughs> derivative. Now more on um, differential calculus, uh, 
when we talk about the derivative and so on, we are also talking about a function which is differentiable at different points and so on. Um, it's also good to uh, know when are the situations when a function is not uh, differentiable. Um, again, I give you uh, three um, <coughs> scenarios where um, <coughs> function is not differentiable in, 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 in um, at a con discontinuity at a point where there's a vertical tangent and at a kink. A kink here means um, something at a sharp corner. Okay, to describe it in a very loose sense, that is a, a, a sharp corner. Now I'm going to show you a couple of examples, uh, three examples, and in each of these examples, the function is not differentiable at x equals to zero. So this is the first one. If you have f x equals to one over x squared, for example, at x equals to zero, all right. Um, there's a discontinuity and uh, this function is not differentiable at x equals to zero. Another example is, for example, we have f of x equals to cube root of x. And uh, at x equals to zero, we have a vertical tangent. Um, and by definition, the limit at that point for the derivative, if you, if you use the, uh, the um, so-called the uh, definition of the uh, first derivative, you will have a limit to, to evaluate, and that limit at x equals to zero does not exist. So it's not differentiable. And um, <clears throat> this is the third situation. Let's say we have f of x equals to mod x, or absolute value of x. You find that at this point here, at zero, zero here, there is a corner. I mean, to put it in very simple terms, uh, there's a kink, and at that corner, the um, <clears throat> function is not differentiable. Um, uh, the, the word kink is to illustrate a situation like this on a graph. So if you have many uh, corners, such corners in, 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 a, in a graph and so on, you might say that the function is very kinky. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on to integral calculus. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> again, I think it's important to uh, sort of know uh, how to introduce integration, what is integration, and so on, and what are the ways of uh, introducing this concept. And I find that in many of the secondary school textbooks, um, they usually, usually uh, introduce it as anti-differentiation or the reverse process of differentiation. But that may not be the only way to uh, introduce a concept. Yeah? And uh, <clears throat> perhaps we can talk in terms at a higher level as the limit of a Riemann sum and um, area under a curve and so on. So uh, again, due to time constraint, I'm not going to talk about so many things, but just focus on the idea of uh, uh, <coughs> approximations to, to, to areas as a way to motivate uh, integral calculus. And uh, tell you this story about Archimedes uh, trying to find an approximation, actually was trying to find an approximation to pi. Uh, and um, um, using what we call the method of exhaustion. In this case, the method of exhaustion doesn't mean that he applied the method until he got so tired. No, it, mean, it means that um, um, he, will, he will increase the, the, the value of n. In this case, n is the number of sides of a regular polygon as inscribed by a, a, a unique circle as uh, shown here. And um, I'm not going to go through all the mathematics. I think you can, you can figure it out yourself that um, theta in this case is uh, pi over n, where n is the number of sides of this regular uh, polygon. And um, of course, theta is in radians. And this n-sided regular polygon um, uh, will have an <coughs> area of n over 2 sine 2 pi over n. That's one little box in your handout that you fill in, but I think it's good for you to go through the exercise to uh, see if you can derive it. Um, hopefully some of you have already done it before coming to this lecture. And of course, if you want to find, use this, this, this idea to find the area of the unit circle, unit uh, circle, that means the radius is one, um, you will let n tend to infinity, right? That means you have more and more uh, sides of the polygon, and as you increase the number of sides of the polygon, well, you get to a situation where the polygon is almost looking like the circle. All right. 
Um, I promise to tell you a story. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story about Archimedes. No, it's not about him and Eureka. And <laughs> it's another story. That, that, that's why I say there are actually many colorful characters in, in, in mathematics. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's good to, to, to read up on, uh, read, read a little bit about, uh, about these characters. Now, uh, Archimedes is, uh, was a very intelligent, uh, as, as you would expect, uh, very intelligent man. And um, uh, because he's so good at solving problems uh, for his people at that time, um, uh, he became quite famous, quite well known. And at a time when uh, his city, um, Syracuse, was being uh, invaded by the Romans, um, the uh, Roman leader uh, actually knew that there's this man called Archimedes and ordered the soldiers, you can kill anybody, I told the soldiers, you can kill anybody, but don't kill Archimedes. Because I think they realized that he's still, he was still useful uh, to them. Yeah. So there was this Roman soldier who went to uh, Archimedes' house and then asked him, who are you? You have to make sure, you know, before you so ask, ask Archimedes, who are you? What's your name? Um, but at that point, Archimedes was very engrossed in solving a problem. You see? And uh, of course, they didn't have tablet PC and all that at that time. They have tablets, but stone, <laughs> not tablet PC. And, and he was drawing his circles on the sand. You know? in, in, in front of his house, he was drawing this in, in, in the yard of his house. Eh? He was drawing all his drawing, his circles and so on. And this soldier came and interrupted me and asked him, who, who are you? So, of course, he get very irritated and say, hey, don't disturb my circles, you know. So, of course, he did not give the, the soldier his name, so the soldier killed him. And that's how he died. <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> I, or at least that was what was recorded, yeah. So, anyway, um, that, that's one story, and that's about Archimedes. And he was uh, probably uh, the first person to put forth this idea of uh, method of exhaustion, and this gives rise to what we now know as limits. And the, the, and the idea of using it as a way of finding the area of uh, plane figures. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we can um, also um, introduce integral, you know, a parallel to, to what, what I've uh, just described as area under a curve. And again, uh, I'm going to um, use, I'm not going to use a, um, do it by hand, but uh, use a tool like this. For instance, if I were to use uh, graphmatical, I can actually use this to find the area under this curve, let's say from x equals to 0 to x equals to 5, about there. Um, so 0 to 5, yeah? And um, maybe if I want the right-hand sum, maybe not 10 rectangles perhaps, and I get something like this, yeah? So, um, and I got answer something like 10.4616. If I want higher accuracy, uh, obviously I can uh, choose uh, more uh, rectangles um, and I get something like 10.6922 and so on. And, and you can see that um, I'm using integration, in this case numerical integration, um, to find the area under this curve. And that's also one of the ways to, in some sense, motivate the idea of integral as area under a curve. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have thought about um, differentiation and the derivative, and it was uh, developed to solve a certain set of problems, mainly uh, uh, rates of change or, or um, um, tangent to a curve and so on. And we have talked about another problem, which is defined areas and so on. And it turns out that these two um, apparently seemingly separate problems are related, and they're related by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, part two. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but I just want to mention that uh, this um, theorem uh, basically tells us that there is a relationship between integrals and the derivative of a function. And, um, and, and, and that is um, the, the beauty of, of mathematics. This theorem, in fact, is a very powerful statement. Let me again uh, go back to what uh, we did right at the beginning of the lecture when I asked you to give me a few numbers, five numbers, and we uh, put all the five numbers together and we could find a, an equation 
that relate all these uh, apparently unrelated uh, numbers. So we have e to the i pi plus 1 equals to 0. Now that is the, the, the beauty of mathematics. In this case, we have uh, two ideas or two concepts. At that point in time when they were uh, this, uh, discovering or developing these two concepts um, or ideas, uh, nobody knew or thought that they would be related. And finally, there was this um, uh, theorem that connects the two, that connects integration and differentiation. And in mathematics, very often we find such things happening and you begin to wonder, you know, something like uh, calculus, for instance. Is it really an invention? We know that Leibniz and uh, Newton had uh, independently developed this idea. Of course, during that time, they fought over who is the original so-called inventor. All right? But is it really an invention or is it really something that is already there but waiting to be discovered? Um, so again, this is a very philosophical kind of question that um, I will leave it to you to decide whether you want to uh, discuss it in your tutorials or leave it to your tutors to decide. But that is one um, uh, idea about uh, you know, what we can do with our calculus and so on in, in terms of discussing it at a higher level. Um, um, <coughs> applications. That's the next section. I think we all um, know that um, calculus uh, can be a very um, um, <coughs> top, a very good topic where you can, uh, to, 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 to use as an example where you can apply it to uh, di different disciplines, um, whether it's in the sciences, um, in e economics, in social sciences, in engineering, in, 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 and so on. There are many areas where you can uh, uh, use calculus. Um, so I will not go through all that, but then just bear in mind that um, um, <clears throat> these are the topics which are probably um, um, it would probably be good that if you have if you are not familiar or you have forgotten some of these problems that arise in the applications of calculus to uh, go back and revise and refresh. Uh, like I said, I don't want to say too much about this, but later on uh, I promise you a performance on this application of calculus in terms of velocity, acceleration, and so on. So let me uh, quickly uh, conclude. Um, <clears throat> there are some pedagogical issues that I think uh, we ought to think about, and uh, I have four points here. Okay? The first point is uh, computations versus concepts. What do I mean by that? Now, um, we can teach uh, calculus in a very computational, mechanical way. That means you just tell your students, this is a formula, don't ask why, uh, you don't have to understand why, but you just use this formula, use this, and you just go through, practice um, 2,000 problems on this, and you'll be good, which may be true, yeah. yeah. And, uh, or you, alternatively, you can say, okay, this is a concept, you know, this, uh, you, you, can, you can describe the, the whole idea of what is a derivative and so on, and then, you know, giving very little practice. I mean, whichever way it is, I think extremes are not so good. So I think a, a, a good way is to balance the teaching of calculus with understanding of concepts as well as the need to, for some kind of drill and practice. Computation, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> instrumental understanding versus relational understanding. So if you only teach procedure, uh, you are only giving one way of understanding, which is instrumental to the student. So they may be able to perform uh, some differentiation or some integration and so on because the student has memorized the steps, but that is only instrumental understanding, may not be able to relate to the actual concepts and so on. Uh, perhaps it's also important to balance between um, these two extremes. And this is, of course, uh, uh, put forward by uh, Richard Scamp. So I'm trying to relate to uh, whatever you have done in uh, uh, theory of learning, uh, learning theory. Okay, flavor versus rigor. Um, I think um, just now, um, uh, earlier on, I went through the whole process of uh, solving or finding the first derivative of certain functions. I used two examples from first principles. Um, that is to demonstrate to you uh, the rigor that can be involved in um, finding the, even, even finding first derivative of a function. Um, but do you really want to go through that in your secondary school classroom? Maybe not. 
Uh, but do you just say that, okay, we don't care about the rigor and we, we just memorize the formula? Maybe not. So um, flavor, by giving a flavor, that means uh, that uh, sometimes you may not want to go through the whole rigorous process of um, from first principles solving certain things, but you may want to talk about how it can be done without actually getting your students to, to do it. That's what we mean by flavor. You give a flavor. Or you may show examples, but then you can always tell your students that at this point in time, maybe they are not ready for the full uh, process of going through the rigor. So my point is that at different, stage, uh, different stages of their development and understanding, um, the student will, may or may not be ready for a certain level of rigor. And as a teacher, you need to be able to assess and then uh, judge. So again, rigor by itself sometimes may not be appropriate. That means you do all the very rigorous mathematics without you know, um, caring whether your student can understand. That may not be the best way. But then again, without the rigor, it also may not be very good. So again, your balance between giving rigor and giving flavor. Uh, finally, applications versus appreciation. I think, um, like I said before, um, um, calculus is one subject within, or one topic within mathematics that uh, you find many applications in, and also in, in, in other disciplines and so on. Uh, but do we want to teach calculus because of that? that is, you know, we can just apply anywhere and so on, rather than uh, teaching it uh, because it's a beautiful subject by itself. That's why. That's why uh, in this lecture, I also show you um, certain ideas and maybe some, some of the uh, uh, things that I talk about is to help you raise the level of appreciation for the topic as well. Okay, so these are, these are some of the pedagogical issues that you may want to think about yourself and whether you, you subscribe to one or the other and so on. At the end of the day, as a teacher, you should have your own conviction about what is most appropriate for your own student. Okay, thank you. That's the end.